We're gonna dive right in. Um, I guess one thing that uh, I would start off is, is how many of you think working with investors is fun and easy? No. Right? <laughs> right? No. Oh, okay, good. Nobody does. Because really, working with investors, it's a great way to do business, but it's not really that much fun, right? It's definitely not easy. The one thing I noticed, you know, I'm only a year in the business, but I worked with three investors this last year, you know, 10 regular, like residential sellers. The investors, there's no emotion. So it's, it's just numbers. Yeah. So it took out all the emotion and that kind of stress, which I kind of found in a different sense to be a little easier, but they know the sure. number so no BS, so you gotta really be in the game. Right, and that's a good point you bring up. They are a little different because you're right, they're emotionless. Like they don't care if they offend somebody with their offer. They don't care if anybody likes them, right? They just have a business to run. And they're gonna do it where with buyers, you know, you want to submit an offer that you're not gonna get yelled at, or should we write a note to go along with this so they like <laughs> us and they think we're fun? Like none of that's gonna happen when you're working with us, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, I guess more or less like I like to start off with like a little reality check, right? Like working with investors is hard. Working with investors can be great repeat business. However, it's not easy. Once you get your systems and models in place, it, it becomes a lot easier. Once you have leverage, it becomes a lot easier. But it is a lot of work, so we're gonna start off with that. Okay, so then Jen and I kind of sat down and we were brainstorming a little bit. We're like, what are the key elements or key concepts that you would have to know in order to work with investors well, right? And we're assuming that you're not just doing this like casually, like I have a buddy who's an investor and once every six months I should have a property and maybe go buy it, like actually working with investors. Um, so the first thing, the first key element is you have to be able to be quick. You have to have speed, right? Um, speed in responsiveness. So for example, like when Jen and I are doing this, um, and when we first started off, we worked with another, another agent. And that lasted for about 26 hours because <laughs> right after that, like, so we would want to see a property. And, but he had to do it on his time. And then we want to put an offer on that. And then it was on his time. And it's not that it's all about us, but when it's about speed and everything, like you gotta be able to submit offers like crazy fast. You gotta be able to show a house like yesterday, um, especially in this market right now, right? I mean, we already know that things are going pretty fast. So for an investor, when there's a thousand investors out there all looking at the same property, um, time, speed, everything. So if you can't be fast or if you just like to work at your own pace, be, you know, uh, get things done kind of casually, I don't know if working with investors is gonna be any fun to you or even worth your time. You know, so I would say one thing, one key element is absolutely speed, um, just from the responsiveness, just from the seeing gaining access to homes. Uh, we already know you're not supposed to just send them to the house, right? You're not supposed to just set up a showing and say, hey, go see it. Uh, you gotta accompany them, or you have to have someone go with them. So you gotta make sure you have the leverage or you have the time. Um, offers, obviously, they gotta be fast. Now the cool thing is with REO offers, you can, I mean, give them an as-is addendum, the MAR contract, and, and, and anything small that you think you need, send that out. We can write an, an REO offer in like five, six minutes now. However, you know, prior, if you're doing a home for a buyer, you know, it's gonna take you a while. You gotta gather all the information. So offers can be fast, but you just need to have the time right away to do it. Um, so what happens then if you're not fast? What are some of the consequences if you just decide to work at your own speed? Well, I know if, uh, you know, I didn't, you brought up Phil. So if any, has any, was anybody in the last classes mm -hmm. that, we, that we did? So you know that I have very little patience with, <laughs> with things. Um, so with the agent that we were working with before, you know, it, it was very frustrating to me when he wouldn't respond that quickly or he wouldn't be available quickly. Or I think with one of the houses we were offering on, you know, it took him two days to get me the contract to sign electronically to, in order to submit. Um, you know, so it was just very frustrating. It, it, and I can tell you that I'm not the easiest person to work with. So, and I know other investors where they care about their business and they want to grow their business and they, they want to get the offer out there quickly. Like speed does matter, responsiveness does matter. The, the time that you spend to submit the offer matters. You know, getting confirmation back that the offer's been submitted matters because we want to know those things. We want to know that we're in the run before everybody else is. Yeah, yeah, and if you're not, you're obviously going to lose their loyalty 
right? They're gonna start talking to other investors or uh, other agents because there are a lot of us out there and we're all trying to work and find repeat business. So someone else who can be faster will gladly take your spot, right? Um, so yeah, you're just, it's just not gonna be a very profitable business for you if you can't be fast. The other thing is that a key element is numbers. Now, what I mean by that is you have to know their numbers as well as the overall numbers. So if they're using hard money, right? And you need to know how hard is the money that they're using or how soft is it? <coughs> because otherwise you can't run their numbers for them uh, or the houses that you're sending them, you have no idea if they're fitting their bill or not. Right? Yeah, which can be equally as frustrating to you because if you don't know what their numbers are, if you don't know how their money works, you could be sending them houses with a 20% margin in their eyes. You think it's 30% and it's a good deal, and everything that you're sending them, they're saying no to. Yeah. They're saying no to, and you're like, what the heck? You know, why do they keep saying no to these, these properties? They're great deals, but in reality, you don't know their numbers yeah. and how they work, and they're not good deals to them. Right, so, so you exactly, and basically to sum up what she just said is it how, what is a good deal to them? You have to know their numbers, not just general platform numbers that we can send, because you don't know if maybe they have, maybe they are a contractor, so they don't have those contractor expenses, cool, so maybe they can look at larger spreads than other people. Um, you know, maybe, and you would hopefully figure out find this out before, but maybe, you know, they're going to sell it themselves. Right, so they don't have a sale on the on the end. They're going to try to to sell it themselves, and if they don't sell in two weeks, then you become the the eight. Um, you know, they're hard money. There are maybe they don't have hard money costs at all. Maybe they, it's their own money, which makes it beautiful, right? Now we can get deals. We, so obviously, you got to know their numbers, and then you have to know the overall numbers. You also need to know, yeah, how to see them. You know, run comps just like every realtor should. You need to know because you're going to do a lot of them. Um, you also need to calculate the buy, hold, and sell. So we talked about that in the previous class, but you should know your numbers on how much it's gonna to cost to buy a house. You should know how much it's gonna to cost to uh, hold it, um, and then you gotta know how much it costs to sell it, because these are all numbers they're gonna plug in before they ever buy a house. Um, and this obviously just helps your reputation. If somebody sends me, like there's a few, a few teams that will send us stuff, and I don't even look at their, their, I don't even look at their properties anymore because I know that the spreads are nowhere near what, what we would like, what we would want. Um, so I don't think I still get the emails, but I don't even open them. You know, versus the people who do send us stuff that know our numbers. I can't wait to get those, right? Because I know there's, there's, there might be something legit in there. So do yourself a favor, and if you are working with investors, take them out to lunch or go, you know, set yourself up in their eyes if you're gonna be their best, their go-to, even if they are working with others you want to be the best one. You want them to open your email, right, or see your homes, um, because in all reality, other people are probably sending the same one, right? So you want, if you're gonna send them out, you want to be the one who gets that deal. The other thing to talk about with numbers is knowing how to, I think I'm gonna touch on a little bit, the comping or your CMAs, knowing how to comp a house correctly, especially when it comes to a flip. Um, you know, because there's, as easy as it sounds to us, it's very difficult to teach. I think we ran into that when we had our assistant. Um, you know, knowing how much value a flip can gain over top of a house that's just in good condition, and that really they're not comparable sales. You're looking for another flip to compare that house to versus another resale, just a regular resale house to compare it to. And knowing, you know, in certain areas like Catonsville, I might be able to tack on fifty thousand dollars to a flip versus a resale right where in other areas you might not be able to so knowing how to do your cmas and knowing how to comp the flips accurately is going to be a big deal with the numbers um you know because the flip side of that is if you don't know how to comp it correctly and you don't have the right numbers in place you're losing somebody else's money right right so yeah which is way better than losing your own money but it's still not fun for them <laughs> right. um that's that i mean but that's legit like if you send someone a property and you, you sell them on those numbers and your numbers are wrong and they lose money, like, I mean, I'm not saying that they're gonna come after you, but who knows if they would do Well, you're yeah. definitely not gonna have clients. You're not gonna have clients anymore. <laughs> so on that note, I was kind of typing, taking a bunch of notes at the same time you guys were talking on that. So Tony, my flipping house down, the client flipping house. Yeah. We use, I mean, he lives out kind of six, right? Yeah. But we use all the comps of resale to kind of justify what we could sell his house as a flip. So you're saying, not, if not they're good. nice resale, possibly, but okay. you want to try and find something that is 
very comparable as far as condition goes for a flip. So it's got similar flooring, it's got similar cabinets, it's got similar countertops, it's got similar redone bathrooms, it's got a finished basement, the basement's you know, nicely done, it's got updated windows. Like you want to find, like if it's a resale, it's got to be a nicely done resale. So you're basically saying most of the flips are, are it's renovated condition, which is nicer than a typical. Right, I mean, because if you think about it, if they're, if, like what we do, we do full gut flips. They're basically new construction when we're done. You know, you're not going to get new construction price for a flip, but you're going to get, you're you're on a different level than resale. So like if it was three levels of resales here, your flip's going to be here and your new construction's going to be here. So you don't want to just be basing your value off of just resale. You want to try and find something in the general area that's similar to the similar finish, you know, and was either a homeowner that redone their entire, redid their entire house before they sold it or an investor that did a flip. Um, you know, just really base your numbers off of. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, speed is one key. I mean, you have to be able to be quick. If you like working on your own pace, working with investors is going to be a challenge. It probably may not be the best for you. Everybody should know your numbers anyways, right? So I mean, that's something that you just need to learn a little bit more about their numbers and make sure that you're calculating them in. Uh, the next one is kind of a, a, a soft skill or a soft element, but time. Like, do you have the additional time? If you're already doing a certain amount of deals a year and you're pretty swamped for time, like, going to work with investors, to me, wouldn't be a good idea because they're gonna wanna see houses, they're gonna wanna, and, and here's the thing, it's always on the drop of a dime too. Like, if, they, if a house comes on the market, they're gonna wanna see it today, they wanna submit the offer today. So you don't have the luxury of, hey, will they get to that next week or whatever. I mean, we don't have that luxury even in just regular residential right now, but um, it's time, you know, they're gonna wanna see a lot of houses. If you're like Jen and I, you might be seeing like seven to 10 of them a week and you're probably putting offers on all of them. And they're all low. <laughs> so, but that all takes time. So, and for the most part, it was, for a long time, it was Jen and I who would who would do those things. Um, you know, then we started to get you know some help, and people could help us that would uh, that would do that. Um, however, we just had to, uh, for for reasons, let one go. So now it's back on our plate, and we're reminded, you know, just how much time that stuff does take. Um, yeah, they're going to want to see properties. They want to write a lot of contracts. You're going to be doing a lot of CMAs. Um, there's just a lot of back and forth communication, you know, just typical responsiveness to go back to the, the top. So just make sure that you have time, that you actually have available time to do this. Now the plus side is, is if you can do these things so far and you do have the time, this can be a nice repeat business, right? So then actually it can free you up for time. Because once you start to know how to write a lot of uh, just quick offers, REO offers, man, it can take you no time to do that. Um, you know, if you're already in the neighborhood and you're going to go see five houses not come out, write those offers, you might get one. Cool. You know, so you can actually get time back once you get good at this, but just know in the beginning, um, you got to have some available time. Um, so then the next one is uh, another one is. Yes, I was going to say time kind of rolls into sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, sacrifice. Um, it's, it's just lots of time and energy. You're writing, like, if you have this fear of writing really, really low offers and offending people, then don't even start with it because you're always writing crazy low ball offers. I mean, if it's within $100,000, we're like, sweet, we're in, right? I mean, especially now, I feel like, so we're seeing something, I haven't seen this in a while, maybe those of you who do it a little bit longer or something are seeing, but uh, even banks, now, because the market's so hot, are starting to flip their own homes. I saw two of them when I was yeah. searching REO the other day. One was in Severn and one was somewhere else, but they literally had renovated the house and had it listed for sale. Yeah. And when I pulled tax records, I could see what the bank bought it back for, and then now what they're reselling it for. So I mean, they're, I think they're getting tired of losing deals. And I also just looked at one today that was in um, Severin, and it was listed for 480, and I pulled, pulled up the comps on it, and there was a really nice house neighbor down the street that sold for 485 and this one needed new floor and new windows new roof new, like siding was messed up like every and they wanted five thousand dollars less for that house than the retail house so i mean the pricing is just crazy yeah so but to tie it into this like i mean if a house was listed for 180 and, and it fits our numbers but only at 79 like we're still writing that offer 
I know that there's a tiny slim chance that we'll get it, but we figure for every 50, we get one. That's where the sacrifice comes in. You might be doing a lot of, a lot of work, right? You might be submitting a lot of offers feeling like this is a waste of your time. You know, I don't know why we're doing this. It's never going to work. He's never going to buy anything. I'm sure people say that about us all the time. They send us all kinds of properties like they'll never buy it. I remember, so our first hard money lender, he's, he's a really great guy. I mean, he, he taught us a lot of stuff. Um, when Jonah and I first sat down with him, I just remember him telling us for every hundred houses that you submit an offer on, because I was just going on to him about I can't find anything. He's like, well, how many houses are you looking at a week? And at that time, it was like maybe two. Right? <laughs> like, I can't you know, find anything. I can't like find anything. Three houses. You know, it was like two, three houses that we were looking at. And, you know, I just remember him just kind of staring at me. He's like, for every hundred houses that you look at, you might get one. Okay. Yeah. And um, that always stuck with me. Yeah. And, it, it, and it's true now because we submit offers on a lot more now than we've ever done. And, um, yeah. I can tell you probably the last hundred houses we haven't got, so maybe we're <laughs> yeah. maybe we're gonna get one soon. But exactly, maybe we're we're doing, well. we're doing well. or maybe the number changed. It's from one forever two hundred. Right. Crap. Right. We got hundred to go. But anyways, so yeah, just know that you're gonna be submitting more offers. Like get used to it. You're not the only one. People are submitting really, really low, embarrassing offers all the time. In fact, one of our mentors would always tell us, like, if you're not embarrassed by your offer, it's not low enough. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not low enough. If you feel confident in your offer, then you didn't offer low enough. Right? And in and, and, and any of the investing, not just real estate, but in any investing whatsoever, the whole idea is to buy low, sell high. That is always the idea. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, doesn't matter. You're always trying to buy low, sell high. Real estate is absolutely no different. You're trying to buy low, you always want to sell high. Right? So that's why you're always putting out those offers, because um, it's not that exciting when you get one if you overpay for it. That's not that exciting. Um, and then the last one is just kind of more of a common sense one. Uh, don't just work with anybody who calls themselves an investor. Um, you know, it, especially like, I would say there's probably a lot of new time investors right now, like new beginners. And that's not to say that you shouldn't work with them, like they need to, to learn just like we needed to learn. We had to learn a lot of hard lessons and, we, and, and hopefully we have and we're getting better. Um, but make sure that they do quality work. Make sure that they're people that you actually want to do business with and that they would be loyal to you. I mean, we've heard scenarios where people, you know, agents help them get houses and then they go around and give it to another agent to sell. That's not somebody you want to work with. So do yourself a favor and just kind of like I said before, before you do any business with them, like take them out to lunch, get to know them. Make sure there's somebody that you think has integrity. Make sure there's somebody that you want to work with, um, that they do what they say. You're not embarrassed to sell their house. Um, yeah, there's we, plenty of stories about that. Yeah, yeah. Or just quality of work, you know, and yeah. trying to sell a listing, you know, that looks beautiful in pictures and all your feedback is just like walk into the house and wow, what happened <laughs> yeah. there? Yeah, you know? and we've been there, right? So we know what it's like to sell a house that probably should, should be up, right? So in all reality, this is a very, very important one, but it's, it's a, just a super easy one to do too. Right? And also, rolling, with us. Yeah, just also rolling back the numbers in betting. So, you know, make sure that whoever, like if somebody calls you, if you get a lead on an investor that calls you, figure out like what their credentials are. Like, do they have a hard money lender set up? Do they have private money? Are they expecting you to help find them, oh. these people? Do they have a contractor lined up? No, go ahead. Oh. Um, you know, like how, what is their business plan? How are they going to get this business started? Or are you the first step and then they're gonna lean on you to figure everything else out? Because that goes back to time also. Like, do you have the time to work with somebody right. that is maybe on the newer side yeah. and doesn't have all their ducks in Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I just want to find out, when you're dealing with investors, do you expect to sign a buyer Agreement with a buyer, uh, I mean, solo mm -hmm. agreement with them. I like it. Yeah. Because nice. I had one who wanted my services, but he refused to sign a contract. I said, oh, well. <laughs> so, yeah. the, 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 where that comes in to be difficult is just when you have an ex. So, the difference between uh, uh, you want to find out is are they a new investor or an experienced investor? And there'll be pluses and minuses to both. Like I was saying, with a new investor, it's going to probably be a lot more time on you. But that that, that type of, of uh, investor, you might be able to sign up a buyer's group because well, let's work this together. Well, he's been around for a while, and he had other agents who tried exactly. prior to that, and they couldn't sell the property. 
Right. Pro the property is not even worth selling. Yeah. But the thing is, I wasn't going to do all this work. I believe I can sell anything. So I wasn't going to do all this work. Yeah. For somebody who wasn't willing to sign. Yeah. And right. I mean, I'm just saying, if, if you commit to me, I'm going to commit to you. Well, to but, this but the only thing is, is that you're working with experienced investors. They're all going to have multiple people who set up houses. So for you to get a buyer agreement representation, just you, I don't think most experienced investors would ever do that because they're getting wholesalers sending them stuff. They're getting other agents from other companies sending them but stuff. But she could get one um, just for that. Just for that property. Oh, just for that. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I misunderstood that. Yeah. Talk yeah. about um, Yeah, so for this to work, like, there's expectations on you and expectations on the investor, right? Yes. Both have to show up. So like, I, I assume knowing how direct you both are and on how smart you both are, that you're having expectations. I like that you looked at me when you said how smart you uh, are. <laughs> <laughs> he pointed at her with direct. And like, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, oh good my kick up. <laughs> okay, so moving on. What does that expectations conversation look like that you have with the investor? And, and specifically what I'm looking for, what do you tell them you're expecting from them? And if you do this, then it's a win-win will work with you. If that's not a fit, then we're not your people. So, so I had an investor that bought um, a new construction right back. Yeah. Like my, my whole spiel with him is I've got a connection with the builder. I know I can get you this amount off the price. And this is what your rent's gonna be and I think we can get you this much more for rent. If we do this deal, when you go to sell it, when the lease is up in two years, I want that listing. Yeah. And you know, that was that was the expectation talk and he was fine. Yeah. yeah. He was fine with that. Yeah. What yeah. other ones? Because I imagine like yeah. they have to have the they have to be motivated, they have yeah. to have the financials. What is when it's important to move fast, like right. we don't move fast, we need you to move fast. Right. And that's probably gonna be two different conversations depending on if they're new or if they're experienced. Someone who's yeah. experienced is pretty much gonna want you just to send them properties, see them like just do the actual objective work. I don't really need your opinion. I don't. Really, I just want you to send me properties with CMA. So our, our talk with them, or our, their talk with us, depending on what side we're on for the investor or the agent, is more or less gonna be, what are you responsible for? And this is what I'll take responsibility for. So with an experienced investor, it's very black and white. Pretty much, right? Like you still wanna like each other, but it's, this is what you're gonna do, this is what I'm gonna do. In the end, I want a list, I'm gonna send you houses in the beginning, and you're gonna look them over, you're gonna get back to me. Yeah, so and an example of that is I have an investor, um, he lives in Virginia, yeah. and he's trying to get into the Baltimore market, and so when he called me about it, um, you know, he wants a rental and he wants to be able to do a burr, which is on the back where we're really playing in a minute, but, um, so my expectations talk with him was, do you want me to just send you anything, or do you want me to send you stuff that I just think the numbers work on? And he's like, no, I just want you to send me deals that you think the numbers work on. I don't want to just get a standard automated email from Maris for anything that happens to come up in this neighborhood because I don't want to have to look at the numbers myself. I'm like, all right, yeah. yeah. You know, and then I was like, okay, so how are you paying for this? <laughs> yeah, right, so, right, right. It does work. You know, yeah. and then he was like, well, I'll send you a bank account. I have cash. I'm like, okay, send me, send me the bank account. And, you know, before he went out to look at houses, um, probably how long ago was that? Like a couple months ago because there's nothing on the market now. You know, he had the bank account ready. He had the buyer's agency rep signed. I knew exactly what he was looking for. And then we went out and showed him a couple houses to offer yeah. on, you know. Um, but yeah. with a newbie, it, it could be a completely different conversation. Yeah. Have you all handled like any type of like conferences or do you only um, represent investors that are looking for rentals because you all do flips or like how do you all handle that situation? No, I mean, I think we're extremely creative. Like we, we have no problem. I want them to win as much as we're gonna win because that makes them excited to work with us and we're excited to work with them. Sometimes that means we win a little less and they win a little bit more, but then maybe the next time it's flip flop. So it really is very much a, this has to be a win-win. It has to be something that you're gonna see as, as a very profitable relationship in us as well. Um, obviously there are times where you just do a one deal and that's, and that's it. But we always try to set it up so that way, you know, like for example, I mean, we're both agents. We should sell all our own houses. But if someone, an agent brings us one, we give them the listing. You brought it, right? I wouldn't have had it if you didn't. So we'll give you the list. So just getting creative, caring about what they need and what they want. Because otherwise, there's enough investors that they can send that property to someone else and they'll buy it. So I'm glad that they bring it to us, you know? 
Um, you know, as far and with the conflict of interest thing, like the guy that I'm working with now, like he's he's interested in a completely different area of Maryland that I have no desire to go to. Right. So would I be intrigued if I found a deal out there? Sure, but it's not my area, and I'm not going to go check on it, and I'm not going to want to go out there to see the renovation through. So like I. I'd rather give that to somebody that can be a repeat client for myself than to try and force myself to travel somewhere that I don't want to go to. You know, I'd rather stick to our little niche areas yeah. and stay in my happy place than, than go outside of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think even another way to kind of answer your question, Mike, like the expectation talk, uh, talk is whether they're experienced or new, uh, when you sit down with them, because I really think that you should get to know them, it's hopefully going to be a relationship thing, actually walk through the process of an entire flip and just lay out like who's doing what, all right? So from the very beginning, how are you, Mr. Investor, seeing properties? Do you expect me to send them? Okay. And what would you like, right? Go through the credentials from there. Okay, like Jen said, how are you buying this house? Okay. You know, and walk through the process of the flip, and at the end of it, you'll have a clear picture of who's supposed to be doing what. Um, on either side. And obviously, if, if there's a point where it doesn't work, then it just doesn't work. You know, then not every investor do you have to, to service and, and work with, uh, and then likewise. Sometimes it just doesn't work, you know, and that's not a bad thing. Um, so these are just some of the, the, really working with investors outside of, of these skills here isn't crazy, it's not that hard, right? It's just gonna take a lot of time, you gotta be fast, you have to know their numbers, it's gonna take a lot of sacrifice in the beginning, and then make sure that you actually sit down, meet with them, um, you know, and get to know them personally, people that you wanna work with. How, how do you find your investors? You know, I, I would say, I mean, there, there's enough out there, whether you're posting on Facebook or Facebook groups, or whether you're just putting it out there in your database and we're looking to invest that can help. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, they're not hard to find right now. It's just finding them deals is the tough part. Um, so, okay, any questions on working with investors?